Um, thank you. It's a, it is absolutely a thrill to be here. This, this room is full of, of, this is a room full of heroes to me. Uh, I start with Baltimore Velasquez, who I've watched for 40 years with Flock uh, in Northwest Ohio and well beyond that. And he has supporters and friends like Fran here with him. I look at Raphael with the Malawi TAC tobacco workers whom I just met a moment ago. I look at Tom Harkin and George Miller, who um, is where I learned this in many ways. I came to Congress in 93. Uh, George was already a longtime veteran. Who was, he started young, but he was a little older than I am. Tom had been doing this for a long time, and both of them you know, are always on the right side fighting for people. And I look at Judy's work, and so many of you, I mean, you really are heroes to the labor movement and heroes to justice. Um, I, I came across a quote just the other day from Theodore Hesburgh, who was in Washington in August, uh, who said, you can't blow an uncertain trumpet. Think about that, you can't blow an uncertain trumpet. And I look around this room, and uh, people like Ann Hoffman, and so many of you have been doing this for so many years, blowing that trumpet that was not at all uncertain, and how important that is for this movement. And as I said, it really is, to me, it's a, it's a room of, of real heroes to our country, often unsung, but recognized by those of us that are really paying attention. I want to say a couple of words. I, this is, um, for those I don't really know very well, this is my voice. I'm not sick. I don't smoke. I just talk this way. Um, and this is a true story. My, my wife and I were at an event in a room sort of like this, but no tables and chairs. Everybody was sort of squeezed together. And George knows my wife well and knows that she, um, she always has a response to damn near anything. And we're standing, people are standing together, and I was speaking up front for a couple of minutes. And as I began to talk, true story, this guy turns to my wife and he said, never met her before, and he's standing real close to me. He said, I can't stand that guy's voice. And Connie said, really? And he said, yeah, when that guy speaks, man, it's, it's like fingernails on a blackboard. And Connie said, I kind of like his voice. And he said, you like that guy's voice? And she said, yeah, you know what, I really like it. He said, when? And she goes like this and he leans in and says, I really like it when he wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, I love you, baby. <laughs> Which is actually a true story. And one. One more, one more real quick story by my wife. My wife is, many of you know, is a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. She um, writes, she writes weekly columns for Creators um, Syndicate, which is a very political, pretty hard hitting, progressive columns about women's issues, about health care, about labor, especially. She writes about about civil rights, about police issues, everything. And then she writes a more feature kind of family stuff for Parade Magazine once a month or so. So one day, about three years ago, during the Republican primaries for president, she was writing in an Alabama newspaper, there was a story um, about our family that she wrote in Parade that was kind of a soft but very nice piece. And then she had a more political story and he had this Alabama paper the same day. So she gets a letter, she gets an email from this guy from Alabama and says, Dear Ms. Schultz, this is during 2012, keep in mind. Dear Ms. Schultz, how can, a, how can a woman who's so nice to puppies be so mean to Rick Santorum? <laughs> and she writes back, and women, and you'll appreciate it, she writes back that, you know, women are complicated creatures. They can hold conflicting thoughts in their mind at the same time. This guy writes back, you sound like my wife. So anyway, <laughs> enough of that. Um, let me tell you a real quick story. I, my, my first year in Congress, I watched, I particularly watched um, two people in the House of Representatives on NAFTA. Um, I had run talking about NAFTA in my campaign, skeptical, planned to oppose it, but didn't really know how. And I was sort of an understudy for George, with George Miller and David Bonnier, two names that you know well in the House. Um, Harkin already moved to the Senate, so he was too important to work with me. And um, <laughs> so George and David and I, 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 and I, so, you know, we lost. We were very close. And you know how presidents operate, and we knew, we knew, like this year, we were up against the President of the United States, we were up against Republican leadership, and we were up against corporate America. That's what trade fights always are. That's why they're so tough. That's why the fact that we get close and, and raise these issues and shine a light on these issues is, is so, so important and so difficult. Um, but after, after NAFTA passed, three or four years later, I, at my own expense, I flew to McAllen, Texas, rented a car with a couple of labor organizers, and we walked around, we crossed the border, and, and wanted to see what NAFTA looked like. And here's what I learned in that trip. 
I remember walking, going into a neighborhood where all these workers were working in the maquiladors, all underpaid, all treated badly, all needed a, a real union like Flock or like, like the electrical workers, Brian Baker, or like a real free trade union. And I noticed in these shacks, these shacks were mostly constructed out of building materials from uh, wooden pallets and cardboard boxes from the companies where they worked. I also noticed behind, in these neighborhoods there, was, there were little ditches which uh, children were playing nearby. There'd be two by fours over the ditch. Kids would be playing in this stuff. And the American Medical Association said that was the most toxic place in North America because of human and industrial waste in these ditches that meandered around this neighborhood. Then nearby, and this is really the point of the story, nearby was an auto plant. And this auto plant was modern. A lot of these workers worked there. It, low wages, but this auto plant looked just like an American auto plant that I'd see in Avon Lake or Cleveland, Ohio, or Toledo, Ohio, Fran, or, or Baltimore. And, but there was one difference between the auto, they, they both had workers working hard, both had modern technology, both in the U.S. and Mexico, obviously productive plants. The difference between the American auto plant and the Mexican auto plant was the Mexican auto plant didn't have a parking lot because the workers couldn't afford to buy the cars they were making. You could go halfway around the world uh, to Malaysia and you could, go to a, you could go to an electronics plant or to China and the workers couldn't afford to buy the cell phones they were making. Or you could come back to Colombia and you could go to, a, you could go to a, a, a farm where they were planting flowers that they would then cut and send, particularly in February, to the United States and those workers couldn't afford to buy the flowers for their family members. And that's really what's happened with trade agreements. It's, it's not, if they were lifting workers in Malawi up and workers in Mexico and workers in Bangladesh so that they could have a decent standard of living, it'd be a whole different kind of debate. But, but we, we know that's what's at stake. We know um, that's, that's the importance of, of fighting on trade agreements. Not just, as Judy said, shining light on these trade agreements but explaining them to the public, which frankly already understands these. Trent Lott, uh, George probably remembers this, and, and Tom too. Trent Lott used to say you can't pass a trade agreement in an even numbered year because the public's paying attention and the election's around the corner. That's why you will see a push TPA now, and if they pass it, which is not at all certain, thanks to the work of Jan Schakowsky and others, um, there is real opportunity to prove this. But that, that is our mission. I'm, I was on the phone today with some House members. Uh, we lost in the Senate. We got much closer. 70% of Senate Democrats voted no. Um, we got, I believe, seven Republicans, six or seven Republicans voting no, um, much further than we've ever gone on a trade agreement. Uh, T TPA, as you know, governs potentially 60% of the world's economy. You combine 40% of the world's economy with TTP, TPP, and another 20% with TTIP, so we know how important it is by far the biggest trade fast track agreement that we've ever seen, and that's, that's why that's at stake. But let me, let me close with this and why this award means so much to me and why your activism is so important, because I, I, I know enough people in this crowd, and I know how effective you are when you organize and the difference you made. Um, George and Tom and Jan and I, and I don't, there are other House members here, or Senators, I apologize, um, have served with John Lewis for many years, have served with John. So many of you know John. John is a hero to damn near anybody that's ever watched him, let alone met him. John, um, John uh, in, in February, in March, uh, I was asked, I was the co-chair with a senator from South Carolina, a Republican senator, Tim Scott, to lead the delegation of 90 members of Congress uh, to go to Selma and to commemorate the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge to Montgomery uh, that took place in March 7th, 1965. Well, the, 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 the Bloody Sunday was that day, then they actually walked later and, and made, made the actual trip. And John, um, John, as you know, was beaten up more than anybody else in the Civil Rights Movement. He was the youngest person to speak at the March on Washington uh, with Father Hesburgh and Dr. King and, and others. But John tells this story about growing up and we were riding on the plane together and he was telling me and he said, he, he told this, the story I'm gonna to relate to you um, about activism and not giving up. He told this story of all places, 
just a less than a year ago at graduation at the University of Mississippi in Oxford. And just think, John Lewis, going back 30 years earlier, that, John, that somebody looked like John Lewis, let alone I mean, a member of Congress or not, would ever get to speak at Ole Miss at graduation. I mean, that tells you something. But John, John's telling this story that he told at Ole Miss. He said, he grew up in, he was born in 1940, he grew up in the 50s, um, grew up in, outside of Troy, Alabama on a chicken farm. And he said, when I was a kid, when I was maybe 12 or 13, I went into Troy one day and I came back and I said to my mom and dad, I said, what, what does all this mean? That colored only, white only, colored waiting room, white waiting room, colored drinking fountains, white, white drinking fountain. What, what does that mean? And his parents said, John, don't ask questions, don't make trouble. So he went to his grandparents, he said, she said to them, he said, what, what does this mean? Whites only, coloreds only, what, what does this all mean? His parents, his grandparents said, don't make trouble, John, don't ask questions, don't make trouble. So. John's telling the story, he said, 19, when I was 17, I met a woman named Rosa Parks. When I was 18, um, I met a man named Martin Luther King Jr. And I told him this story, and they both said to me, John, ask questions, make trouble, make good trouble, make serious trouble. And when, um, <laughs> when, I, when I look at this room, and again, why this award means so much to me, when I look at this room, and I think about how you all do things to make trouble, to make good, serious trouble. It's how you change the world, and it's what you're doing, and I'm so appreciative to all of you. Thank you.